Okay. Um, right. So I'm Dave Appleton. I'm from a company in Malaysia called Hello Gold. Um, and well, let me tell you the story, really. Um, okay. So in 1997, Southeast Asia had a financial crisis. Uh, different people give different reasons for it, but the most common one is it came out of Indonesia together with a, a change of power. Um, the Malaysian ringgit value went down by a, over 40%. Um, the worst hit was Indonesia, Indonesia, where the value of the currency went down by over 80%. And, you know, banks closed. Uh, there were major problems. Um, the then dictator um you know basically got kicked out and it, it brought in a total regime regime change so it was a major crisis in, in the whole region and it impacted people a lot i mean you know so like businessmen who relied upon imported goods you know suddenly everything cost twice as much people who'd sent their kids overseas to study you know the kids either had to come back or they had a very difficult last year. Um, so it was a major upheaval. And when I gave this talk at FCC, I was talking about 97, but it now looks as if we're probably going to be talking about now as well. So you know, we are going to have major upheavals. We've seen we've seen the Fed are printing money like it's going out of fashion, and that's going to affect everybody. So, Hello Gold was created from the time when our CEO was the Chief Financial Officer of the World Gold Council in London. He had the oversight of. Um, Spider Gold, which is a gold, the world's largest gold ETF. And he saw how through the 2008-2009 crisis, gold was able to hold its value when currency lost everything. Right? So we're, we're looking, so as a result of that, um, when he came back to Asia, he had the idea of bringing this down to a micro level to allow ordinary people to uh, protect their savings, because you know the large, you know the rich people, the affluent, they can protect what they've got easily. Uh, but it's the ordinary people who always lose out, and we're seeing that again today, of course, right? Um, as one you know, relatively well-off Malaysians said, you know, in this crisis, I could move to a smaller house, I could get a smaller car, you know, I can eat different food, but it's but it's the, the ordinary people that are having the biggest problem. So we're looking at people in a situation where, of course, we're also seeing that, you know, the affluent get more, more affluent compared to the ordinary people. And we're, so we're trying to help the ordinary people say, uh, protect their wealth. And we're doing it, obviously, through gold, because that's what we have experience in. And that is, to date, still the biggest proven store of value. So what we built is a... And it's basically a traditional, a traditional app, you know, a traditional client server app, centralized system where we keep gold in a vault in Singapore. Um, we are legally incorporated everywhere that we do business, which means, of course, we are also suable. Um, and we allow ordinary people to buy gold from 
as little as about 25 cents, which is like one Malaysian ringgit. So what they're buying is fractionalized ownership of one kilo bars of gold. And we are building up business relationships with people like insurance companies, like loan companies, so that if people have their savings in gold, they can use that as collateral. Um, it was interesting to see that in the US, they actually say that a lot of people have difficulty in raising about 400 US. In, in Malaysia, that num 400 US is about what people may earn in a month on average. Um, <laughs> And they have, um, in emergencies, people can access far less than that. So we are trying to get people to save. And then if they have an emergency, they can collateralize the gold to get preferential loans. So we do this through a traditional app. Currently, we are serving over 30,000 users. And... I, I can't remember how much gold that they have on average. It's very hard teaching people, especially struggling people, to be pr prudent in terms of savings. But we, but we're we're making progress on a, on a on a regular basis. So this is what we are doing. We have operations in Malaysia. We have operations in Thailand. We are oh working on opening up something in Indonesia and we're working on partnerships to to basically help people in other emerging economies now that is what we're doing which kind of doesn't have a lot to do with the conference but one of the things that we do know is that yeah we have blockchain here and there in our back end um, we have a gold-backed token called GoldX. It's an ERC-20, which takes fees, which is an interesting little token. Um, but it, um, So we have been in the crypto space because we started looking at blockchain for running the whole thing way back in 2015. So we'll, we have been in the blockchain space for a long time, but not really selling, you know, like in as tokens or anything like that. Mainly because we have found out, just like everyone else, that people in the crypto space tend to be one of two kinds of people. They they either earn their crypto and hold it, or they trade it. And if you hold it, you're waiting for the value to go up. If you trade it, you're playing on the rise and fall to make your money and gold in the crypto space is a hard sell everyone here is finding exactly the same thing um you know we've seen it's a volatile market right so my big reason for talking to a conference about this is very simply that one of the things that attracted me to Ethereum, and I've been, mess I've been working with Ethereum since late 2015, is the number of social impact and financial impact projects. And all of, the, yeah, many of these are raising funds for a particular goal, you know, they're trying to achieve something specific which helps people. And the problem is that if they use something US dollar based, we're going to go, we're going to see, you know, currently that we're going to go through a period of inflation that's really going to come out as a result of this financial situation we're in now. And if you go for crypto, it's basically kind of like a casino. You can't do any financial planning on that. So we are asking specifically financial impact and social impact projects. 
if you are raising money, can we help you? Can we help you put some of the money you have raised into gold as a hedge against fluctuations in your fiat accounts and your crypto accounts? That is basically it. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I'm a big believer in Ethereum in particular. Um, the, theory, the theories behind cryptocurrencies and so on. But at the moment, we do not have a big enough pool in any currency for it to remain stable to be a store of value. Gold has proven itself time and time again to be a good store of value as a hedge of, against inflation. So that is kind of really all that I have to say here. It's trying to help people in the community who have specific goals they need to, they, they need to achieve and they want to do financial planning in uncertain times. When I first created this, um, yeah, I'm an optimist. As as was said, you know, I planned like an almost two month trip through Europe. Uh, when in Malaysia we had we had Corona right on the doorstep in Singapore, um, you know, I'm an optimist. I did not expect to see any of this happening as fast as it did. Um, I was totally shocked arriving in Amsterdam and finding the place deserted, uh, seeing France locked down and the UK locked down and everywhere. Um, so, yeah, that was it, really. If we can help, we would love to help. That is it. Is there anyone there? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. Does anybody have any questions? Larry, Bitcoin, Cobra. Huh. Well, um, I had to work uh, partly out of that, but um, for sure the, the question is, if you have physical gold in a vault, yeah, mm -hmm. as a security, um, and of course in the markets you're operating in, Technically spoken, how can you ensure all those um, KYC, CTF, and all other uh, uh, bullshit terminologies that we are encountering these days? You know, especially with fractional ownership of the mm -hmm. code itself. Okay, can you expound on that a little bit? Uh, okay, I mean, now, yeah. yeah. These days, you know, under those, I mean, we are we are we are doing comparable things, and it's really great what you are doing. But um, you highly run into, you know, governmental red tape, into regulatory problems, and apparently uh, using uh, real assets. I mean, real hardcore uh, assets, hard assets like gold yeah means that you are vulnerable to any kind of um seizure or any other you know legal um attack that might block you you know from from whatever using you know the gold having access to it and then mm -hmm. of course producing a lot of problems for a company like insurance companies like um companies that give even small credits based on the securities if they mm. cannot be sure that technically they could have access to these securities. Okay. Um, I think one of the things is, you know, we have to look at the area we're operating in. Um, the gold that we have at the moment is all in Singapore. Um, we will also soon be having gold stored in Switzerland. Um, from our, you know, obviously, you know, we understand that everything we're doing is a trust-based model, which sort of like kind of goes against everything 
you know, everything here. Um, so we have to make best, what? Best case assumption. Yeah, best case assumption. I think that's a good word. So best case assumption that, um, yeah, if we had the gold in the US, I think that would be kind of dangerous, right? As we've seen that, you know, they're quite, they're quite open to grabbing goods which are going to one country and diverting them to them and stuff like that. Um, you know, Singapore can't afford to do that because the only thing that keeps it going really is the fact it's a financial center. Switzerland, I think, is in the same position. You know, they, one of the key things about Switzerland is the fact that people have to trust them or the financial center goes down, it goes down the tubes. So, you know, I think that if Singapore were to start seizing assets, if Switzerland were to start seizing assets, we would have a far bigger problem than, hey, I've lost my gold. I think we'd be, we would be at a point where we'd start seeing everything breaking down. Um, you know, and you, know, you, wouldn't, you, you probably wouldn't even be able to trade Bitcoin because you wouldn't have computers running, to be honest. That's my that's my guess on it. Um, you know, the the one backing we we give is there are points of law that say that once you have bought gold, it is your gold legally. <laughs> it's um, because um, Singapore works to some degree on parts of English law, and that's a guarantee in English, in, in some strange part of English law that I don't totally understand because I'm a coder. But I'm assured by our legal guys that the gold is yours once it is bought, and we are a register. Yeah, we are legally registered entities. Um, KYC, yes, you have to do KYC. Otherwise, you couldn't claim anything back anyway. Um, did I cover anything there? Or am I just waffling? No, no, it, uh, it's uh, absolutely, absolutely fine, and I'm totally on your side. You know, I'm. I mean, we, we are, I believe. I the difference, uh, Larry, is that um, Dave is working with people that come out of that environment and big players in large holdings. And yeah, what, what were the, 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 the founder and CEO, what was it that he controlled before he started okay. this? Okay, he was he was the chief financial officer of the World Gold Council. Now, the World Gold Council is an industry association to promote gold, but they worked to help help set up Spider Gold, which is the world's largest gold ETF. And so, uh, in his position as CFO, he had oversight of it. You know, he was responsible for making sure that all the accounts were done properly and everything else. And so all it was that stuff, all of the all of the regulatory business he had to provide the, the stuff for so that it worked, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I mean that's the point. We can we come into this with probably some of the best um, gold experience that we could possibly have and some and a whole load of the best gold, you know, contacts in gold to make sure that we're doing everything the best way. He also set up something quite similar with Bank of China before he left the World Gold Council. You know, so Bank of China actually ha have a, um, a gold savings platform based on, based on his work. Um, I'm, 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 as I, I'm totally convinced about the gold side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we have this worldwide bullshit uh, so-called FATF, F-A-T-F regime. Yeah. Uh, which is basically um, used as a weapon against anybody uh, who could be charged of potentially money laundering. Now, I was wondering if someone, you know, got your fractional um, gold-backed coins and would mm. transfer them to another person, yeah? Or they would use it, you know, um, for whatever, you know, could be considered as money laundering or even, you know, terrorism financing, which is uh, basically the, the two items they, they mainly use. That we, forgot, we forgot child porn. 
Yeah, sure. No, that, that's the most important aspect, of course, but that's only between the two of us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I understand that we, we, um, you know, for all for all of our stuff, even where it's not necessary, we do insist upon KYC because we understand that laws can change overnight, and we want to be prepared for it. Um, you know, we're not. Uh, you know, it's a hassle. It's expensive. Um, but it's kind of like the best we can do, really. Yeah. Um. And as I say, you know, if if I'm pitching this to a project which is a financial inclusion or a social impact project i don't think there is a problem with providing that kind of information it's like company information before you open a bank account or something like that yeah. um I st i've stopped pitching goldex to individuals a long time ago because you know, as, as we said you know i don't think to be honest people in the crypto sphere have got any particular interest in gold you know certainly not bitcoiners if you, if you look at people attacking peter chef um you know it's, it's kind of just different different interests and you know gold x has borne it out digix is bearing it out that yeah. basically none of them are really taking off and i don't see them taking off yeah well um I think I think the, the paradigms might be changing. Yeah, also the more people get into the space from even a Bitcoin side, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, they also get interested in gold. And of course, uh, like Bitpanda is also offering, and other exchanges now are, are, are offering fractional ownership of gold bars. Uh -huh. which I'm I'm with Andreas Antonopoulos. In fact, is a little bit hard if you think it through. Till the end, but of course your case is a is a much better one apparently, because yeah. it really helps. I was just wondering, but I think I, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. Um, if you if you're really helping the poorest of the poor, you know, to 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 grow a little bit, you know, to be safer, you know, in their behavior, to to be capable, you know, to save uh, to save their um, uh, there's there, there are little resources that they have. It's fine for me. I, I just want to keep you know this project going on and not be endangered by any stupidity of our so wise governments that we are uh, have everywhere on this planet now. Yeah, well, um, I think I mean, if you were to look, if you were to to look for a video of the Prime Minister of Singapore giving his public announcement either yesterday or yesterday the day before something like that um i think any american watching it would be surprised that a company a country could have a leader that thoughtful that eloquent giving a talk right um you know singapore thinks about things carefully it's kind of run by technocrats yes um yeah, which is why we got a whole lot of confidence in Singapore, and so uh, yeah, and I, that's also one of the. It's actually one of the things that allow, that helps us promote it in Malaysia, because people in Malaysia have confidence in gold stored in Singapore more so than gold that would be stored in Malaysia. Yeah. So, yeah. Great, super. Thanks. Thanks so much for your presentation. It was really great and great to listen to you. Thank you. Hey, Dave. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> you know, I'm on, I'm on your, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asset sovereignty agnostic. And, mm -hmm. and so when, Yash and I sit here and, and we're, we're building our applications and, you know, our, our dream is basically we'll take any transactional, uh, denomination crypto or, or fiat. I mean, cause it's just, it's pretty much frictionless to move in and out of anything anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. There's, there's yeah. an exchange, there's a, 
you know, there's a buyer on the side of every sale we've, we've mm -hmm. seen, right? No matter yeah. how far Bitcoin has dropped, there's always been a buyer on the other side of the sale. And, and what we've seen in the, in the last, in the last drops is that it's retail that's buying. It's not institutional, it's not it. right? Mm -hmm. And, and so, I mean, if it functions and somebody wants to take it, I don't care whether it's, it's C containers of Marlboro cigarettes or, uh, you know, <laughs> or, oh, the old thing or model, yeah. with Ethereum <laughs> on Tether. I mean, who cares, yeah. right? There's always a bridge. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, like I said, it's different kinds of appetites for different kinds of people. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very pragmatic about a lot of things these days. It probably comes with age. But, um, you know, I think... One of the big things is that, you know, we still live in the age where people put post-it notes on their monitor with their password on it. Do you honestly think they can keep private keys in any shape or form? Um, Let's say 40% uh, cannot manage a private key, but 60% mm -hmm. don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was it. I mean, we can, you know, we were, we actually worked on a, in parallel with the the traditional backend, we worked on an Ethereum-based backend that we were planning to put on a POA network until we found out that some, something happened when when our volume started ramping up. That network couldn't that network could not keep up with the transactions. Um, we we did have a method which kind of had man what we called a managed wallet where somebody had a private key on their phone um which they could not restore but we could change the ownership of the so the wallet was a little bit like like a single owner multi-sig but we could change the owner if they lost the, if they lost the key going th as long as they proved the kyc stuff and stuff but it was all very very clunky and yeah very so yeah i, th I think We've got a long way to go. When you come into the Ethereum space, you realize that you can actually use it for anything. A lot of people are using it for crazy stuff. Um, you know, and where you stand, it's different people doing it for crazy stuff, including people thinking what you're doing is crazy. You know? um, but I mean, I yeah, I'm quite, I'm kind of pragmatic, and I I think that you know what we really need is something that people are going to use. That's it. I'm down. Um, I'm down with that. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to take a break here and get ready for the next talk. Thanks so much. Yeah. All right. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Bye.